Now we're going to move on to um, session eight, and I think you'll recognise the woman who is about to <laughs> go to the podium. Um, you remember um, Ita Mangan from our inaugural meeting in, in October. She spoke to us then. She comes in a, wearing a different hat today. Today she's wearing her hat as chairperson of Age and Opportunity, and um, she's going to um, tell us about um, creating opportunities in retirement, and she's going to look at the evidence from civil society. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I have a confession to make. I started work in the 1970s, and I recognise that that means you can all figure out fairly clearly that I currently hold a bus pass. So I, what I suppose upsets me a little bit about a lot of what I've heard today is that the same issues were being discussed in the 1970s, 80s, 90s, noughties, and we simply haven't implemented the uh, measures that are, would be required to encourage greater participation in society by older people. We actually know an awful lot about older people. We've, from the 1980s onwards, we had the National Council on Ageing and Older People. We now, and they produced a series of very, very good reports on the status, the health, the income, etc., etc., of older people in those days. We now have Tilda, which is producing fantastic information, and you've heard some of it here today. But we do know an awful lot about it. And we know about but people who are active, we know they're contributing significantly to society and living life to the full. And we, we have been talking about all of this for some time, but the one good thing is that the discussion has gradually moved from a focus mainly or exclusively on care issues to a broader discussion about living well. Now, I absolutely recognise that care issues are crucial and that the uh, issues have to be addressed and the, we still don't have the right to home and community care, which we ought to have. But however, the broader issues have come onto the table to a greater degree. Now, the broader issues have come onto the table to a large extent for economic considerations because of concerns about the abilities of governments to fund the pensions, and we heard a lot about that this morning. The, I'm a little bit concerned that these broader issues should be seen more in the context of rights, and I know Emily addressed this a little bit earlier as well. The, European Year of Older People was held in 1993, and that was designed to make people aware of these, the issues that are arising. The then Equality Authority produced an equality strategy for older people in 2001. We have already heard discussion about the National uh, po uh, Positive Ageing Strategy and its lack of implementation. But actually, there are a whole lot of other strategies that would have a bearing on the lives of older people. For example, the Information Society issued a, st a document on IT access for all in, I can't remember the exact year, something like 2003. If that was implemented, older people would have much greater access to IT and would therefore have much greater access to work and various other activities. There was also a white paper on adult education, learning for life, which would have benefited older people very substantially had it been implemented. So we're back to the whole problem that we have great knowledge, we have great ideas, but we are really bad on implementation. There's a major inconsistencies between stated policies and actual policies, and the most glaring in that respect is obviously the care uh, issue and uh, over the preference for institutional care, if you like, over home or community care. But the as a society, we need to address how we can enable greater opportunities to be available to older people and then enable them to take advantage of those um, opportunities. Obviously, more financial resources would help with this, but I, initially, I think we need more awareness and better organisation at government level. The government does recognise the need for better organisation, but again, its many strategy documents in that area are not being implemented. So we have the voluntary sector as well, of which I'm representing here today, or at least part of the voluntary sector I'm representing. The voluntary sector is not well organised either, it must be said, and we have too many organisations in the older sector not operating together sufficiently well to promote the interests of older people. The one advantage, great advantage the voluntary sector can provide is that they can provide joined up programmes which bring together all, a number of government departments and agencies and provide a total solution, if you like, for older people who are interested in getting involved. I'm only going to address very briefly the question of work because it has been addressed to a very considerable extent here already today. It is my view that older people should have the same right to work as older people, as younger people. They may choose not to exercise that right, but it should be there. 
As you know, people leave employment for all sorts of different reasons, because they want to retire. Some people can't wait to retire, and they want to do something else with their lives. Other people hate retirement and feel that their life has come to an end. So that we should be sufficiently organised as a society to allow both sets of people to make choices. I mean, clearly, and this was mentioned earlier, it makes no economic sense to force people out of work when we have skills shortages. But the primary issue should not be addressing skills shortages. It should be the right of people to remain at work if they wish to do so. Now, there are a lot of obstacles to, to uh, staying on at work, and uh, the most obvious one is the mandatory retirement age. There are also social, physical, and organisational barriers uh, to pe older people going back to work or staying in work. And some of them result from the attitudes of society, but some of them are actually due as well to older people's view of themselves, because a lot of older people don't see themselves as having the capacity to contribute. In my view, mandatory retirement ages should not be allowed to continue. They were described by an EU commissioner in 1999 as a waste of resources, but again, the issue shouldn't be seen exclusively in economic terms. I do recognise the problems that can arise if people stay in a job for a very long time, but we can deal with that by having term limits on particular jobs, and then people won't be able to do that. The argument has been made that facilitating older people to stay in employment will result in loss of opportunities for young people. But exactly the same arguments were made when it was proposed to abolish the marriage bar for women and when equal pay for women were being introduced. The sky did not fall in and men did not lose jobs or pay when all of that was implemented. So there's no reason to believe that doing something similar for older people would have anything like the sort of uh, drastic effects that are being suggested. I do think we need to ensure that the removal of mandatory retirement age wouldn't be used as an excuse to reduce pensions. People should have a real choice about continuing to work and not be effectively obliged to do so by cutbacks in pension provisions. At the same time, I accept that we have to address the pension age, and that was addressed uh, to some extent here this morning. I think you have to bear in mind that when the pensions were first introduced, they were only introduced on the basis that very few people would ever qualify, because most people didn't live beyond the age of 70, and that was the age at which pensions were originally introduced. At that time as well, most people started to work at 14 or 15. Nowadays, most people start to work in their 20s, and the... Uh, if they qualify for a state pension, they could well be receiving it for 30 years or more. That would be fairly normal uh, in, in, for many people. So working life is now shorter than it has been in the past. And it seems to me there's little choice but to raise the pension age. The fact that more people, that more time is now spent outside paid employment than in it is a success story. I mean, people don't need to work all their lives and can enjoy long years of retirement. But it can also be seen in terms of the exclusion of people, not just from the labour market, but from other aspects of society, because sometimes exclusion from the labour market brings that exclusion from other aspects. How, how this is seen is largely dependent on the individual's attitude to work, because as I said already, for some people, they can't wait to give up work, and others want to stay there. The link between pensions and retirement was originally seen as removing the barrier for, of work, or sorry, removing the burden of work from older people. And for those who regard work as a burden, this remains a valid consideration. But there's no necessary link between pensions and retirement. It is possible to have pensions available and to remove the exclusion from the labour market at the same time. There are upward age limits, in fact, for contributing to both social welfare and occupational pensions. And people who work beyond those ages cannot contribute. This could be changed without a great deal of difficulty, and it would have the effect of treating older people at work in the same way as their younger colleagues. It would benefit the social welfare and occupational pension systems, and it might encourage more people to continue on at work. Christine talked a fair bit about the volunteering aspects for older people, and in theory at least there are no barriers to older people becoming volunteers, and there are a wide range of areas in which volunteers are needed. I actually recently met a 97-year-old woman who was engaged in cooking meals on wheels for what she described as the old folk. The, <laughs> Benefits of volunteering are very well established, but there is the problem that the people who are most likely to benefit volunteering from volunteering are the people least likely to be doing it, and we do have to address that problem. There are many, there are so many areas where volunteering is needed and welcomed. I mean, the, one of the programmes provided by Age and Opportunity, the sporting programme, which I'll describe shortly, that relies significantly on volunteers. And wearing another hat, I happen to be the chairman of the Citizens Information Board, and our information services 
benefit greatly from the expertise provided by volunteers who in many cases are retired from work and bring their work experience and professional knowledge to help other people navigate the government system. I want to talk a bit now about Age and Opportunity and what we do. It was established in 1990 um, as a result of a survey carried out on younger people's attitudes to ageing. And our motto is life is for living. And it aims, among other things, to inspire people to make choices that lead to fulfilling healthy lives as they age. In effect, it encourages full participation by older people in society. So we organise events to the, to in the areas of arts and cultural activities, sport and physical activities, and opportunities to learn and be involved as active citizens. We receive funding from the HSE, the Arts Council, Sport Ireland, and from a number of philanthropic foundations. The experience of participants in our many programmes is uniformly positive, and many go on to be not just participants, but active organisers as well. So I'll briefly describe the programmes we organise. There's huge scope to, advance, to um, expand these programmes and to introduce others which similarly encourage active living. In the area of arts and, and uh, uh, cultural activity, I mean, national and international research shows the clear benefits which result from creative engagement by older people. One particularly interesting finding, and you can find the, if you want to go delve into this in more detail, the Age of Opportunity website has the details of these studies. But one particularly interesting finding is that involvement in the arts leads to increased cognitive capacity. And this is especially true of involvement with music. Age of Opportunity organizes uh, Bialtana, which is one of the world's first arts and creativity festivals for older people. About 80,000 people took part in Bialtan events in 2016. For those of you, um, which I know does not include Judge Lefoy, but for those of you who are not terribly familiar with Irish, Bealtaine is the Irish for May. Um, the, the results for this year's Bealtaine events are not yet there, but 80,000 people in 2016 is a huge number of people who have benefited. And these events are organised all over the country with 447 different partners, including local authorities and voluntary groups. The range of cultural activities is very wide. There's music, dance, poetry, museums, art galleries, short story writing, theatre, collaboration between different act uh, artistic activities, for example, poetry and music. Older artists are encouraged to be involved, to meet each other, and in some cases to pass on their wisdom to younger artists. The Dawn Chorus, for example, attracts a very large number of people. It's definitely for people who get up early in the morning, who are the in people at the moment in Ireland. One participant described her participation as involving not retirement, but rewirement. There is no such English word, but I think you get the, uh, the sense of it. As part of the 2017 festival, Bealtaine has created an opportunity for a care setting and its residents to engage creative, creatively with a visual artist over a course of a number of months. We also run a specific arts course called Azure for people with dementia in care settings. We have a scheme of cultural companions which creates local networks of people interested in arts and culture who accompany each other to events. This is to get over the problem that people who, for example, have lost their partner and have nobody to go to the pictures with or go to a cinema or go to the, the local uh, drama festival or whatever. So the cultural companions in 2016, we had 193 cultural companions and they uh, accompanied 552 people to, to a number of different events. On the the second major programme we have is the Go For Life programme, and this aims to get older people more active more often. It's the National Programme for Sport and Physical Activity. It's run by volunteers who we call Physical Activity Leaders, or PALS. Care PALS workshops aim to empower staff and volunteers in day and residential care settings to lead suitable physical activities with older people. So it's not just in the community, it's also in care settings. The, there are now 10,000 people taking part in Go For Life activities. There are over 1,000 active uh, physical activity leaders. And we also um, operate a grant scheme for local groups who wanted to do similar types of work. But one participant recently described how she got involved at various levels. She started going to a local Go For Life Keep Fit class, and from there she heard about the Go For Life PALS training that Age and Opportunity provides. She did the PALS training, and when the local Keep Fit instructor left, she took over the Keep Fit class, and she still runs it every week. The people in her class are aged between 56 and 83. She then organised a team to compete in the Go For Life National Games, and contacted the local men's shed to get them on board. 
They held events every Tuesday in preparation for the Games. The Games are held annually, and they involve teams from all over Ireland who usually turn out in their local county colours and represent Tipperary or Limerick or wherever they happen to come from. Age and Opportunity also then provides a range of workshops and training programmes directly to older people and also to others who are in involved with older people. This is to promote active citizenship and to encourage uh, resistance, if you like, to ageism. So we have the Get Engaged programme, which provides workshops and courses to encourage and strengthen participation in the older people's councils in various counties around Ireland. Older people's councils are beginning to be established by the local authorities as part of their engagement with local groups. So the, we, have, we have that programme running in six counties this year. We have Creative Exchange, uh, course which is for anyone who wants to lead creative activities for older people in care settings. We have an AgeWise which is a workshop delivered by Age and Opportunity which aims to raise awareness of, age, of attitudes to ageing and older people among organisations whose work affects the life of older people. So in other words it can be done in employments, in various care settings, in uh, any, any aspect of life where uh, ageing age can be an issue. We have an Ageing with Confidence programme which offers a holistic approach to health promotion. I'm just giving you an example of some of the things that are done. All of this is being done basically on a shoestring. We are very grateful for the state support that we do receive, but further state support obviously would allow this, for the state and indeed for the tropic support, would allow all of these programmes to be ex extended more widely and to be made available to everybody. Finally, uh, I've got a good quote from Margaret Mead, the anthropologist. It is utterly false and cruelly arbitrary to put all the play and learning into childhood, all the work into middle age and all the regrets into old age. So we ought to be aiming to have play, learning and work at all stages of life and thereby reduce, if not entirely eliminate, the regrets. <laughs> On a lighter note, we should remember that opportunities take many forms. I can't quite see this taking off in Ireland, but I was amused by an article in The Guardian last week which reported that what they described as US old timers were discovering the high life on a cannabis tour. <laughs> cannabis had recently become legal in Seattle, and instead of bingo, tea dances and seaside, residents of retirement homes are going on pot for beginners tours. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>